Romans 8. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified, more than conquerors. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? Thank you. Well, obviously, it's a complete joy to have uh, Brandon, Mary-Kate, and Eileen uh, with us this morning to celebrate Eileen's baptism. And we love having children in the church, and we also have a rule with children, uh, by the way, here in the chapel, that if a child makes a noise in the church, there's no need to take them out. We much prefer to have noisy children than no children at all. So if you have a child with you. Um, But what a joy, you know, that word joy and baptism, I think, really do go together. Joy is the feeling of pleasure and delight. And we feel pleasure and delight in the fact that Eileen has been born. So part of this sort of service, this event, is to give thanks for Eileen's safe birth. And of course, we give thanks to God for that. More specifically, you know, we give thanks to that life force that gives us life, that we couldn't possibly understand who or what that is, but the nature of that life force we call God, um, and it's beyond all understanding. As it says in Psalm 131, which I always rather like, my heart is not proud, Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great things or great matters that are too wonderful for me. An understanding by what we are blessing, Eileen, is, is, that, is that non-understanding bit. We just have that sense of that life force that blesses us. But we can give thanks. And it's often said that, you know, if we don't know how to pray, if you don't know what to pray for, the simplest thing is just to start by giving thanks, by expressing our gratitude for all that's been given in our life. And the birth of a beautiful New life is not only a good reason to give thanks, it also reminds us of all the gifts that we have in our world. So part of us being here is to give thanks for Eileen. And there's more than that, though. Baptism, I think, is also about setting a standard for the way that we're going to help this little new life into the world. And this is Eileen is paying strict attention at this particular moment. So I'm very pleased that, uh, that she is. Brandon and Mary-Kate and the godparents are promising to bring up this child in the values of love and care that are so central, I think, to the message of all religions. Jesus said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And this child is therefore going to be brought up with the promise of love being at the center of her life. And what more important promise can there be? In our world, it's money that seems to make the world go round. But in reality, the truth of the matter is, is that it's love. It's love that brought the world together in the first place. It loves that brings, it's love that brings people together. It's love that advances civilization and society. And it, it's love that enables us to care for each other. Love is essentially self-giving. The universe was created by the urge of that life force to manifest itself in form. When we love someone, we're willing to give of ourselves for that other person. And that giving is giving a part of ourselves. And there's therefore an essentially a selflessness about love. And how important is that in our world today? A selflessness. So to promise to bring up this child in the context of love is a radical step. 
Now, I know that, you know, most people, when they have children, want to bring them up in the context of love. But in baptism, we promise to do that. And that promise, like the marriage that, that myself and Brandon and Mary Kate were involved in on Smuggler, is a promise that's witnessed by a community and witnessed by the whole of creation. That's why it's different to make the promise here. It doesn't mean they're, they're any more likely to keep that promise, but it does mean that you've started life with the bar quite high. And both Godparents and all of us here are here to support Brandon and Mary Kate and Eileen in keeping that bar up there until the time comes when Eileen can make those promises for herself. Uh, and when we baptize someone as a child, the godparents, as you saw, speak on behalf of the child. They make promises that they then support the child in keeping until they take on those promises themselves. That's what's different between the children's baptism and an adult baptism. And in adult baptism, uh, the, child, the, the, the adult will say the promises themselves. And here, uh, they're said on behalf of Molly and Andy. And then when Eileen, if she does come to confirmation, which is done by a bishop in front of a congregation, she will take on those vows herself and say, yes, I, I take those vows for myself. So we can give thanks. We're promising love. And we're also receiving Eileen into the community. And that reading uh, that Brandon's mum read is one of my favorites. I love that line. And we know that in all things... God works for good for those that love him. For all things count for good for those that love God. And what that really means is that however rough it gets, and it gets rough for all of us, however rough it gets, if your eyes are on God rather than the roughness, then good will come out of the situation. If your eyes are on that divine nature rather than the roughness, then good will come up of the situation. That's the same idea as seek first the kingdom of heaven and all things will be given to you. All that you want will be given to you if you seek first the kingdom of heaven. And it's really saying if you put God first, if you put that divine nature first as a priority in your life, then everything else fits into place. And that's one of the values of our community here. And at the end of the service, you know, we say we, you know, that little service we did for Eileen, we say we welcome you into the fellowship of faith. And we do. We say how great it is that this family and this child have decided to embark on a life that's rooted in the eternal rather than the temporary. A life that's rooted in the eternal rather than the temporary is meaningful rather than purposelessness a life of order rather than submit to the chaos of the world. Now, I know this is putting a bit too much pressure on Brandon and Mary Kate and the godparents. Uh, and, you know, that's why we do this in a community. And, you know, without a community, that would be the case. But being part of a community means that burden is shared. You know, there is a village here that can bring up this child. And as a community, our part is to offer to be that village. So you're not on your own when you're doing it. And as the reading says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. It means that those of us who are known by God are ordained to actually receive that, that same nature, that divine nature in our lives, which is basically to say that if we take this path of gratitude and love and community it won't be in vain because what we've recognized over the centuries is that there is a wisdom that affirms the reality of goodness at the heart of all things. Over the years, all civilizations have discovered that wisdom that there is a goodness at the heart of all things. Now, I know we're here in a church and the words that we're hearing directly relate you know, to the Christian faith. But surely if we're dealing with a reality, that reality pertains to all people in all places. And I think that's so important. You know, if we are talking about reality here, you know, oxygen is oxygen, whether it's here or in Australia. And if we are talking about a reality of a goodness, then it pertains to all people. If there is an order at the center of life, then we can rely on it. And that order must be everywhere. And if we affirm here the Christ nature, which is what we're doing, 
you know, the Christ nature that we turn to as Savior, submit to as Lord, and come to as the way, the truth, and the life. Surely that nature must be everywhere, in all places, in all hearts, no matter what other people call it. No matter what name they give it. You know, you can call gravity schmoodly. But it's still gravity. You know, we're still describing the same thing. And if it's not everywhere, if it's not everywhere, then actually it's just an idealized, fabricated reality that we're making up in our minds. It's not a mind thing, this. If it's in all people, in all places, then it's true for everyone. We access it through our understanding of the ministry of Jesus, built on the ministry of Moses. So it can be accessed also, I think, in Taoism, an understanding of the Tao in Hinduism, an understanding of Brahman in Buddhism as an understanding of the nature of the self in Islam as an understanding of the nature of Allah. So in baptizing Eileen into the faith that we hold, we are also baptizing her into the reality that is understood by all wisdom traditions, that there is a force for good at the center of the universe and that we can be a part of that. If God is for us, who can be against us? That is the central aspect of faith that we are talking about here. That's the essence, not of our faith, but of the faiths of the great world religions. And I see these religions, you know, I've always seen religions as being cultural expressions of the same experience, of the same reality. Uh, we all do things differently in our own cultures, and religion is a part of that. But if what we're saying is not a reality, in other words, true for everyone, wherever they are, then what we're saying here is empty words. We're saying we're going to make this up in our minds, we're going to make it special for us. It's not that. When Paul says that we are conformed to the image of the Son, that is true for all of us everywhere if we choose it. And in baptism, we are definitely choosing that. On the one hand, they could be just empty words. You know, when you do baptisms, that all we really want is the children to be done because granny wants it to be done. People come and say, oh, I'd like my children done. And they've been baptized. I said, why, why, why do you want them baptized? Oh, granny said it'd be a good idea to have them done. <laughs> <laughs> sort of insurance policy style of, of doing this. But to truly sign up to what we're talking about here is to choose to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. It's to commit yourselves and your family to enter into that love that transforms ourselves and transforms all those around us. And I'm just going to end with a reading from um, B. Griffiths, who was a Christian monk who went over to India and set up a monastery at a place called Shantivaram, where he engaged with, with Hindus. And this is what he says. I think it's really pertinent. He said, the goal, the goal of each religion is the same. The goal of each religion is the same. It is the absolute transcendent state, the one reality, the eternal truth, which cannot be expressed, cannot be conceived. This is the goal not only of all religion, but of all human existence. Whether they like it or not, all men and women are continually, continually attracted to that transcendent truth. The intellect in and beyond every formulation by which it seeks to express its thought, is actually in search of the absolute. The intellect, you don't, doesn't matter what it thinks or does, it's really in search of that absolute. The intellect is made for being itself. It's made for truth. It's made for reality. And it cannot rest satisfied in any partial truth, in any construction of the human mind, in an idealized, fabricated reality. It's not satisfied with that is always being carried beyond itself to ultimate truth. For many people, the idea of God has ceased to have any meaning. It is like the survival of a half-forgotten mythology. Before it can begin to have any meaning for them, they have to experience the reality of it in their lives. They'll not be converted by words or arguments, for God is not merely an idea or a concept in philosophy. God is the very ground of existence, and we have to encounter God as a fact of our existence before we can really be persuaded to believe in God. To discover God is not to discover an idea, but to discover oneself. It is to awake to that part of one's existence which has been hidden from sight and which one refuses to recognize. That's what Paul's talking about in terms of 
of, of actually predestined, that whole idea. The discovery may be painful. It's like going through a kind of death. But it's the one thing which makes life worth living. And Eileen agrees with me. Good. Let's pray. So we do pray for Eileen, Brandon, Mary, Kate, Molly and Andy and all the families. We pray especially for Eileen's life, that you will bless her and enable her to grow in wisdom and in truth and in love and to follow on uh, to make that confirmation of her faith uh, in life. We thank you that you've brought them here and brought us together to do that. We do pray for our world, the understanding of the nature of reality, maybe in the leader's of our countries. We pray for their wisdom and clarity and love at the center of the universe. We pray for all those who don't feel that, that who are in suffering, a difficulty at war, in prison, in hospital, hungry, homeless. Lord, we pray for open hearts to receive these people. I also pray for those who are dear to us in our community and we think of Think of Patricia Hill, Will Welsh, Pat Smith, Molly McCarthy Coman, Barbara Orcutt, Anne Hodges, Tricia Nichols, Soleil, Lee Bouguet, Donna Ward having a knee replacement this week, Joan Valentine, and Lindley and Sharon Wells. We pray your healing power to these people in Jesus' name. Amen.